Greetings to our online attendees, the Dean, Professor Sylvia Cohenberg, our head of department, Dr. Dave and staff and students. Also help me to welcome our special guest, Professor Robert Beckford from the University of Winchester, Birmingham, England, and Gu University in, in, in Amsterdam. I am Dr. Lisa Tomlinson, a lecturer in the Institute of Caribbean Studies, and I will be your host for this afternoon. The Stuart Hall Lecture was established in 2017 to honor the remarkable legacy of Stuart Hall, a Jamaican born intellectual, cultural theorist, political activist, and socio or sociologist. Stuart Hall made significant contributions to the field of British cultural studies, also known as the Birmingham School of Cultural Studies. Hall's groundbreaking work was deeply inspired by many of our faculty here at the UWI and students. And it is through the Institute of Caribbean Studies that we continue to celebrate his visionary idea and political activism. We oftentimes forget about the political side of Stuart Hall, so I want to stress that. This afternoon, we delve into one aspect of Stuart Hall's extensive body of work with the lecture title, The Windrush, Stuart Hall, and Transatlantic Diasporic Cultures, um, focusing on diaspora and the experiences of the West Windrush generation. Hall's invaluable contributions went beyond theoretical frameworks providing Caribbean people with a deep understanding of self within a hostile and racist society. His work spoke to the diverse Black British communities, illustrating how these communities forged bravely, how they forged new possibilities and identities in their adopted homeland, England. Marked by complex Englishness, if I could use the term, and Caribbeanness. Furthermore, Hall's work sheds light on the experiences of post Windrush individuals as they navigated their journey to become, and I use his phrase, West Indian in England, through the various platforms, whether it be film, music, literature, and politics. This evening's lecture promises to highlight the diasporic dimension of Hall's work while also engaging the political and intellectual elements that have shaped his extraordinary career. Before we move on to our guest lecturer, I want to, or I want you to join us in welcoming to the virtual floor, Dr. Dave Voss, who is the director and senior lecturer in the Institute of Caribbean Studies. Dr. Goss, is an expert in plantation management and African Jamaican religious cultures. I would also like to take this opportunity to congratulate Dr. Goss on the successful launch of his second book in February of this year, his book entitled Alexander Bedwood, The Prophet of August Town, Race, Religion, and Colonialism. For those interested in the subject matter, you can secure your copy of this thought-provoking work through the UWI website, um, UWI Press at www.uwipress.com. Now, without further ado, let us welcome Dr. Goss to give his view. Good afternoon and a warm welcome to the fourth annual Stuart Hall Distinguished Lecture, centered around the theme, Windrush, Stuart Hall and transatlantic diasporic cultures. I'm delighted to see such a diverse and esteemed audience gathered for this occasion. It is indeed my privilege to welcome you as we reflect on the significance and impact of Windrush. Just yesterday at a Windrush forum, I was asked by a member of the audience if a curriculum is in place to teach our children the stories of the Windrush generation. This continued reflection and action surrounding Windrush is a context for this Stuart Hall lecture as we commemorate the 75th anniversary of Windrush. 
We have an imperative, I believe, in cataloging and highlighting our story, the story of a Caribbean people who answered the call to rebuild the United Kingdom. One such success story is that of our distinguished guest speaker, Professor Robert Beckford, director of the Winchester Institute for Climate and Social Justice at Winchester University. I extend a special welcome to Professor Beckford and his family. He'll be formally introduced later in our, in our program. But if my memory is correct, Professor Beckford was also trained by Stuart Hall. So we eagerly anticipate the unique insights and reflections he will bring to our discussions, shedding new light on the intersections between Windrush, Stuart Hall, and the pressing challenge of our time. I also welcome Dr. Les Johnston, another Windrush success story. He's the chair of the Windrush Museum and chair of the Windrush Conference being held in London, June 23rd and 24th, less than a month from now. Dr. Johnson will bring greetings to us shortly. This distinguished lecture series named in honor of the influential intellectual Stuart Hall provides us with a virtual platform for interdisciplinary engagement and critical dialogue. Today we come to celebrate the profound journeys of the Windrush generation. These individuals who left their Caribbean homeland between 1948 and 1971 in search of new opportunities and a better life in the United Kingdom. The experiences marked by resilience and determination have indelibly shaped the social fabric of Britain, leaving an enduring legacy in, hist in, in history, politics, arts, and society. So Stuart Hall, we honor this afternoon is central in a discussion on Windrush and transatlantic diaspora cultures. His contribution to cultural studies and his unwavering commitment to social justice continue to inspire scholars and activists worldwide. Through his transformative ideas on identity formation, race, and representation, Hall challenged established norms, inviting critical examination of power dynamics and cultural hierarchies. His intellectual, Legacy resonates not only with academia, but also in public discourse, informing and shaping societal transformations. At the ICS, it's our unwavering commitment to preserve and honor the memory of Stuart Hall through our comprehensive course offerings, such as Introduction to the Study of Culture, as well as his inclusion as a major theorist in our graduate program, our MA and MPhil program. We ensure then that future generations will continue to engage with its with this profound insights. So once again, I extend my warmest welcome to each of you. I encourage you to actively engage with the ICS, attend our future events, and connect with us through our various online platforms. Your presence and commitment to this, to this academic endeavor are greatly appreciated. Thank you and welcome to the fourth annual Stuart Hall Distinguished Lecture. Thank you very much, Dr. Goss, for your warm welcome. And I will send out additional sunshine to Dr. Les Johnson and Dr. Robert Beckford and our online overseas attendees who may not be getting as much sun and heat right now. <laughs> <laughs> so it's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Les Johnson, visiting research fellow at the Birmingham City University. Dr. Johnson joined us today to bring greetings on behalf of the National Windrush Museum, who is also the chief of the, excuse me, who's also the chair of the upcoming Windrush, Windrush 75th conference, which takes place from June the 22nd to the 24th in Birmingham, England. And he's a respected figure within the field of not just academic, but he's also um, a respected field in the arts. Dr. Johnson. Um, thank you, Dr. Lisa. Um, it's always um, a pleasure to hear the poetic way that you introduce individuals. And um, thank you very much for that. My name's Dr. Les Johnson. 
and I'm the founder and chair of the National Windrush Museum um, in the UK. And I bring greetings, first of all, from the Birmingham City University, uh, which is my research base, and then secondly, from the new formed National Windrush Museum um, in the UK. Uh, first, I'd like to thank um, Dr. Goss, who is a um, very good friend and colleague, and all of the colleagues at um, ICS, uh, particularly Dr. Tomlinson, uh, for the great work that they've been doing in formulating the plans for the upcoming International Windrush um, Conference. Um, as Dr. Goss said, it's going to be taking place in London, the 23rd and the 24th of June. And we have um, two days of, I think we've got 18 panels of three persons minimum per panel. So as you can imagine, there's going to be a lot of knowledge exchange and dialogue around this really crucial issue of, of Windrush and where we are um, in its history. It is, of course, the 75th anniversary um, of the um, arrival of the Empire Windrush in Tilbury. And therefore, it, it does mark a very special occasion. Um, there is a celebration on June the 22nd uh, annually in the UK. But this year, um, it is going to be a whole year celebration, and there are a number of groups who have come together to give their various expressions. Um, it is very bottom-up, community-driven, so different individuals will be expressing themselves in, in a multitude of different ways. Some of them we will agree with, others we may not. But at the same time, it is very good for individuals to be able to, to express um, themselves and their stories and narratives around Windra. Now, there are 2,500 museums in the UK. Um, unfortunately, there's no black museum. Um, and by museum, I actually mean something substantive that can revival, for example, the Science Museum or the Victoria and Albert Museum. So the large museums. There is also no Windrush Museum. And given the contributions that we have made and the uh, pioneers of the Windrush generation have made, their successors um, have made, of course, we are concerned that there has never been, up until now, a National Windrush Museum. We're in the primary stages and we're so grateful for the partnership that we've established with the University of West Indies, um, particularly in the planning stages, we have an Erasmus program which has allowed individuals to travel from BCU um, to UE and uh, it's such a pleasure to be having, I think it's eight academics coming up to speak at the conference. So um, when I met um, Dr. Goss about a year ago and he mentioned the Stuart Hall lecture, um, I immediately said to him, um, why don't we include um, Windrush? Um, as a part of that, because as you know, Stuart was one of our, um, you know, primary intellectuals coming from um, Jamaica into the UK and has made such an impact. I knew Stuart very, very well. And um, um, it's very emotional, this for me, uh, because, of course, Stuart did make such a contribution, not only to Windrush, um, but he practically created cultural studies as we know it um, um, today. And, and therefore, um, it's my pleasure uh, to be able to sit alongside um, the eminent Professor Robert Deckford. Um, he doesn't know this, but I've known him for many, many, many years um, before he started his studies and have been very encouraging in the background. And it's so fantastic to see the body of work um, that he's produced extremely diverse, extremely radical, extremely impactful. So it's my pleasure um, to be here with you, um, Dr. Um, Tomlinson, and thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, Dr. Johnson, um, for your greetings. And it's also a pleasure working with you as well on this very important or significant um, project of Windrush um, 75. Um, we're going to move on over to um, Professor Paulette Ramsey, which is a pleasure um, to introduce um, Dr. Ramsey. Um, Dr. Ramsey is going to be reading from her book, an excerpt from her book, Letters Home. Um, Letters Home is a collection of journal entries 
and its heartfelt letters that provide a window into the daily experiences of the first Caribbean immigrants and a profound impact on their lives and relationships. As a companion novel to Aunt Jen, a Letters Home explores the immigrant experience in the 1960s, Britain, shedding light on enduring consequences that resonates throughout the years. Um, Professor Ramsey's creative brilliance not only captivates reading, or excuse me, doesn't only captivate the readers through a creative lens, but like many of our literatures of the diaspora, it also provides a study, right? It gives us a lens into a study of it in terms of history. So this book, what it does, or this creative piece, what it does, it gives us a, 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 a look into the challenges that are faced by uh, immigrants, new immigrants, particularly the in, right, Windrush generation, um, as they sought to seek a new life in this foreign land. So I would ask you to please join us in welcoming Professor Paulette Ramsey. I will move on to the introduction from Dr. Deborah Hickling, who is also uh, my colleague. Um, in the Institute of Caribbean Studies, a lecturer of culture and creative industry. So we'll move on to that. Um, Dr. Hickman, um, the introduction for Dr. Beckford, and we'll come back definitely to um, Professor Ramsey. Dean Cohenberg, Head of Department, Dave Goss, a very special guest, Professor Robert Beckford, colleagues all and students. Well, when I was given this very special task, I did a little light digging. I happened upon the following question. How can reggae music lyricism contribute to the decoloniality of Caribbean diaspora contemporary gospel music? I was intrigued. I had to find out more about the individual who sought not only to frame this question, but to actually answer it. Because as cultural studies practitioners, our outlook is colored by the analysis of nuance and context. The notion of diaspora, of a professor of black theology born to Jamaican parents from the poles of Westmoreland and Portland and raised in Northampton in the United Kingdom, in United Kingdom's East Mid Midlands, in a Pentecostal church, no less, whose scholarship in theology was inspired by his white middle-class religious education teacher and eventually grounded in the thought of the Birmingham school and who has a wife from Yad, a native of Portmore, St. Catherine. Well, the combination of these contexts got me really intrigued and interested. So who is this man? Robert Beckford, PhD, is a scholar activist who specializes in the intersection of theology, race, and class in black religions of the black Atlantic. He has written eight monographs in this field and also produces knowledge across various media, including television and radio documentaries, drama production, and contemporary black music. Well, Professor Beckford has made over 20 films and has produced and recorded black urban music, including a socio-political contemporary gospel album called the Jamaican Bible Remix in 2017. And he's co-written two BBC radio drama productions. He has three academic roles. He's a climate and social justice professor at the University of Winchester. He's a professor of black theology at the Queen's Ecumenical Foundation in Birmingham. And he's a professor of theology at the Department of Theology and Religious Studies at VU University in Amsterdam. Professor Beckford has won several international awards for his research projects, including a BAFTA, which is a British Academy of Film and Television Arts Award, a Jamaican National Dias um, Diaspora Award, and an International Pentecostal Scholars Award. So it's fitting at this time, as Jamaica and Jamaicans do battle with our context of ethics, morals and coloniality, that we welcome a scholar interested in interrogating notions of Babylon, 
in and through the notes of reggae music and contemporary gospel music, arguing the latter's departure from the, the coloniality. And Professor Beckford has done this by interrogating Steel Pulse's anthem, The Handsworth Revolution, which speaks to a global phenomenon with local implications. And the anthem goes, long, long way we're coming from, to send this message across, across. Been hidden, forbidden, concealed, unrevealed, it's got to come out in the open that Babylon is falling. Babylon is falling. So to provide deeper and greater context, and perhaps to explain the choice of a sweet sup, a sour sup, and a breadfruit, albeit unroasted, as symbols of wind-rushed memory. As a wind-rushed granddaughter myself, I'm pleased to introduce Professor Robert Beckford to deliver the Institute of Caribbean Studies 2023 Stuart Hall Lecture, Windrush, Stuart Hall, and transatlantic diasporic cultures. I give you Professor Robert Beckford. Thank you very much for that wonderful invitation and thank you to the Institute for this opportunity to speak at this very prestigious and important event. Uh, let me just say at the beginning, a slight correction, I was not a student of Stuart Hall's. If I was, I'd probably be about 15 years older than I am. I arrived at Birmingham University as a student when, when, uh, at the time when Stuart Hall was actually at the Open University. But um, what I want to do in this presentation for the next uh, 30 or 35 minutes is place Hall within a broader context than the university. And I hope by doing this, I can provide a more critical approach to how we envisage the work of Hall within the diaspora. Um, my plan is to speak for 30, 35 minutes, which should give us um, an opportunity for questions afterwards. And I have also prepared a PowerPoint presentation so that you can follow the themes that I work through and also because I want to use some visual imagery and some motion captures and films to illustrate some of the points as we go along. Uh, let me just uh, say also that I'm a big fan. I'm indebted to the work of Stuart Hall, but I want to present a slightly more critical approach to Hall's work and legacy for the sake of having us think through more complex ways in which we think about academic scholarship in the post diaspora period, both in Britain and also within the Caribbean. So let me just pull up my PowerPoint, if you bear with me. I'm hoping that you're hearing me clearly uh, without any uh, interruptions. The broadband um, can get a little bit shaky when we're doing these international things and working um, across uh, uh, Facebook as well. So please let me know, Les, if everything is clear. And, and concise, and that way, if there are any problems, and I see your hand waving, I know that uh, um, I should stop or, or that something is not, not working out correctly. Okay, so let me uh, begin. Windrush, Stuart Hall and Transatlantic Diasporic Cultures, Myth-Breaking and Myth-Making. Stuart Hall, the Dean of British Cultural Studies, like all great thinkers, can be assessed through a variety of intellectual and social prisms. His contribution to the development of the discipline of cultural studies, his damning assessment of racialized policing and the contouring of new ethnicities rank amongst some of the most important theoretical developments in the 20th, in 20th century social thought. Yet Hall's work transcends the narrow metrics of scholarly, scholarly endeavors of the neo, neoliberal university, writing books, journal articles and conference papers. His work also has social value. For instance, in the late 20th century, the Black Arts Movement, the Black Film Collective, and a myriad of cultural groups weaponized Hall's cultural theories and cultivated politically motivated art. The subject I was asked to explore in this lecture, however, requires me to contemplate Hall in the context of the Caribbean diaspora cultures. This is an intriguing proposition. Folding Hall's work into the imaginary Caribbean community fosters new lines of critical inquiry, 
The most obvious approach to the task would be to place Hall's cultural theory in critical conversation with the thinkers and cultural artisans of the Windrush and post-Windrush eras. In other words, produce an abstract exploration of thought and practice. But this approach would not be original. To a certain extent, this ambition is fulfilled in John Comfer's brilliant film on Stuart Hall, The Stuart Hall Project, Revolution, Politics and Culture, and the New Left Experience. In the tease of the film, the opening, a Comfer spells out the theoretical entanglements of race, immigration, and culture that have preoccupied called, uh, uh, um, Hall's life and work. And I just want to play you uh, a bit of the tease um, right now. <laughs> As we slide out of the 1980s, who's going to define the cultural themes of the next 10 years? No one on the British left thinks harder about this question than Stuart Hall. Tell me why have they all come to this country? It's not long ago you were bombing Kosovo. Now this is a long-term result of that situation. But I don't know how you could describe the people as bogus. Accommodation and adjustment between blacks and whites is on the agenda. And when I ask anybody where they're from, I expect nowadays to be told an extremely long story. But I think identity is an endless, ever unfinished conversation. But there's something missing from a comfort's approach. The narrative does not readily facilitate a direct and deliberate conversation between Hall's personhood and the African Caribbean British proletariat. Theoretically speaking, we might say that a comfort does not venture into black feminism's epistemological framework of the personal is political. Elaborating on the qualities of this black feminist knowledge production technique, Theorist Patricia Hill Collins outlines a discrete ethic of care and personal accountability as a frame for assessing knowledge production and truth claims. In other words, and to play subversively with Antonio Gramsci's concept of the organic intellectual, Collins is asking for the intellectual to be organic rather than an observer of organic intellectuals. Taking this metric seriously as a focus for discussion requires us to contextualize Hall, that is to secrete him within the waves of post-World War II black colonial citizens seeking opportunity and adventure, as opposed to exclusively positioning Hall within the sanctified halls of the ivory and ebony towers. Stuart Hall's class location, profession and thought placed in conversation with everyday ordinary diaspora folk, reveals a lived tension or fissure, a rupture we can explain by deferring to mythologies. Myths, according to Roland Barthes, are types of speech intimately related to power relationships. No matter what the text, film, literature or art, myths displace the original signified meaning to produce new signs that have other uses. This second order of signification or new myths is never benign. Myths represent a particular view of the world, usually the presentation of a dominant group's way of being in the world as normal. Triangulating myth, Hall, and Caribbean diaspora cultures makes legible a representation of Hall as both myth breaker and myth maker. As a myth maker, as a myth breaker, Paul destroys two white neocolonial myths of the Caribbean diaspora in Britain. These are the myth of black intellectual inferiority and the myth of black cultural immaturity. The former concerns racist ideas about what blacks can comprehend and the latter, the superficiality of their cultural practices. But Hall also reinforces several black people myths. The myths or urban myths manufactured within quadrants of the Caribbean diaspora. Unwittingly, Paul reinforces the myth of the black intellectual as exile and the myth of black religious culture as politically void. The first category concerns the positionality of Paul as a black intellectual and the latter relates to his scholarly neglect of black religion. Myth breaking. 
The long-standing myth of black intellectual inferiority travels with the Windrush generation. Slavery's biological racism is reconfigured into new cultural and institution forms, institutional forms. For instance, coterminous with the arrival of Empire Windrush at Tilbury Docks in the summer of 1948 are critical parliamentary questions raised in the House of Commons. In a letter to the Prime Minister, 11 Labour MPs unashamedly questioned the educational suitability of West Indian Labour. Spooked by the arrival of black people, the government orders an inquiry into the West Indians' arrival led by the colonial secretary, Arthur, Arthur Chris Jones. The inquiry includes deputations from industry and commerce. Several contributors claim that the West Indians did not have the mental ability to meet some of the basic demands of the post-war industrial economy. Like all racist views, this math myth has a pernicious impact on black bodies. It is played out to detrimental effect at the labor exchanges in local communities where West Indians sought work. Covert strategies designed by the conservative government were deployed to structurally underemploy West Indians, even migrants arriving with recognized British qualifications. And there is this really interesting Pathé news report um, that, that emerges in 1955 called Our, Our Jamaican Problem, you know, and that kind of gives away. Uh, where they stand in the title. But within it, it has this interesting sequence where there is a family of West Indians who have moved to Britain who are living in, in London. And, and, and there's a little gesture towards the reality of underemployment. I'm just going to play you a bit, bit of this. Lamalayton Road houses many of the three and a half thousand immigrants who have settled in Lamalayton. Not exactly the paradise so many expected. At number 49, Mr. and Mrs. Austin live comfortably with their children. They are lucky, for many of their fellow immigrants have been crowded six or seven to a room with a weekly rent of 30 shillings each. Mrs. Morgan and Miss Edna Young have lived in England happily for two years. Samuel Davis works as a machinist, though he is a qualified commercial teacher. He too counts himself lucky. The labor yeah, yeah, I don't know if you caught it, but he's a qualified teacher. He okay? comes to Britain as a qualified teacher, but he's working in a factory. You know, it kind of tells us about what was happening at the labor exchanges and how they were uh, demoting, uh, structurally ensuring that there was underemployment for West Indian labor. And this feature, I argue, is a, a part of a longstanding tradition to neglect and disregard black intellectual capabilities in the West Indies, and that travels uh, with the diaspora. But Hall challenges the myth in two ways, through critical intellectual work and a represent representational politics, though the two are not easily separated. Regarding the former intellectual work, Hall invested much of his academic career in identifying the nuances of British racism. For instance, so, for instance, state suppression of black youths is laid bare in halls policing the crisis and black opposition to racism in the subculture classic rituals of resistance. Particularly significant is his identifying of the viciousness of state apparatus in the negative representation of the Windrush generation. Take, for instance, his significant deconstruction of the infamous 1956 picture post image of West Indian arrivals, 30,000 color problems. You know, in the 1980s, Hall, uh, there's a, rep a deconstruction on the semiotics of this image to show how racism was being ingrained within the public's imagination. Next, representational politics refers to Hall's myth-busting as a black intellectual. As a university professor, Hall appeared in significant broadcast spaces on British television. By the 1970s, he was presenting serious issues in programs and later became the face of the Open University's visual television learning suite. This popular pedagogy was counter-hegemonic. It inscribed an alternative vision of Caribbean intellect within the imagination of the viewing public, though Hall was oftentimes critical of the media's use of authority figures like himself, uh, for many, uh, like, like himself, although for many black viewers. Paul on TV was a multiple resistance, at once de demythologizing the myth of black intellectual inf inferiority and through his program content, empowering black viewers with his resistant reading strategies as part of his revision of the communication network. The second myth-busting concern 
is how Hall also demythologizes neg neg the, the negative representation of West Indian culture. Arguably, and just get this next slide up there, arguably an exoticization and concomitant diminution of Caribbean culture is coterminous with the arrival of the Empire Windrush. Those studies of Caribbean music and dance in Britain during the interwar years are also fecund with examples of racialized tropes. But literally, even before the first, first colonial citizens step off the Empire Windrush, the Pathé news reporter covering the arrival defers to black music to introduce the migrants. Lord Kitchener, the Calypso singer, who was also a passenger on the ship, is asked to perform for the British audience. Uh, and respectfully, and possibly commercially astutely, he obliges. And I'm not sure if you've seen this, this piece I'm, uh, I'm from uh, when Bush I'm just on the Empire with uh, no England. To where uh, Kitchener comes in. And I'm told that you are really the king of Calypso singers, is it right? Yes, that's well, so are you true. For us? Right now. Yes. London is the place for me. London, this lovely city. You can go to France or America, India, Asia or Australia, but you must come back to London city. No. Unlike Caribbean folk who know that behind this performance lies a rich cultural and social history, the British audience was ignorant. Therefore, unwittingly, on one level, Kitchener positions black culture at the frivolous and less important fringes of cultural consumption. Kitchener does, not, does however, redeem himself uh, four years later with a critical song about life in Britain to, called Sweet Jamaica. Paul destroys the myth of a frivolous black culture from the early 1960s, his scholarship establishes a new critical hermeneutic, first through his anti-elitist culturalist work during his tenure at the Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies, and later through his material support for black arts and artists in the 1980s. For Hall, culture is a site of contestation and struggle, and therefore inseparable from the battle against racism and oppression. But there's also another dimension of Hall that emerges when we place him in conversation with the black masses within Britain as opposed to viewing him abstractly as an individual separate from the black masses and secreted only within the ebony and ivory towers. And this re re refers to the second part of the paper which is uh, Hall's myth-making. And uh, I'm trying to produce a critique and I hope, hope that it, um, uh, it, it, um, it makes sense. Paul possibly also reinforces myths. Now, within the specificity of this case, these myths are the ones forged in Caribbean diaspora communities. They emerge out of diaspora folk sayings and folklore. Once accepted as true, they concretize into black urban myths. The black urban myth that concerns me here is the black British working class myth that black academics are irrelevant because they are disengaged from the real life of everyday black people. The origins of this myth is complex and it lies partly within black educational frustration with racist educational systems that are translated into everyday tales and sayings. These, these tales take on a life of their own and are eventually accepted as normal. A whole, I wanna suggest unwittingly, reinforces this myth in his autobiography and through his neglect of black religion. Hall does not have a traditional Jamaican background. He travels to Britain as part of the brown skin Caribbean elite as a Rhodes Scholar. He expresses this view in the brilliant documentary by Acomfra. He's also an academic in a time where there were almost no black Caribbean academics teaching the British university system. He joins the new left movement, which was and still is a predominantly white society in Britain. Both locations, the academy and politics, distant, distance Hall from everyday ordinary black folk and consequent, consequently, I propose, weakens the reception of his critical thought in everyday diaspora communities. Let me clarify this predicament by offering a contrast between Hall and the patriarch of my discipline, black liberation theology, uh, James Halcone. Cone 
was also myth-busting, but offers a contrasting vision for the professional academic and their place within the black community. Tony's born a few years after Hall in 1937. Both men are raised in the Americas. White supremacy informs their social experience. British colonialism for Hall and Jim Crow segregation for Cohn. Both men are conscientized by mid 20th century African continental and diasporic struggles for national independence and political freedom, respectively. Yet, while Hall turns to the theory and politics of the European left, black power is Cohn's intellectual nourishment. The chosen ideological negotiation of resistance matters. Arguably, black power ideology leads Cohn to embody the struggle for black liberation in what he teaches, who he teaches, and the prioritizing of a black audience for his work. Cohn, in many respects, demythologizes the black urban myth of the distant and remote black intellectual. Black power, it's important to remember, wasn't just an American thing. It came to Britain, as Kehinde Andrews demonstrates Malcolm X's visit to Smethwick in the Midlands area of the UK in 1964 was in part to build a Black Atlantic solidarity. In contrast to Cohn, Hall occupies a more marginal position, almost like the voice, being an anthropologist on the fringes of black communities, uh, documenting their rituals and totems. What I'm suggesting here is that Paul's biography unwittingly reinforces the myth of a distant disengaged black scholar. The second myth-making consideration surrounds Christian religion. Paul's cultural analysis evades serious engagement with black religion in Britain, particularly the black Christian traditions. Only one major essay in 30 years contemplates the meaning of black spiritual practice. This intellectual neglect in the, is part of the social science scene in Britain. It is quoditia. Over the past 50 years, the black academic left has failed to develop a meaningful sociology of black religion. Many scholars have prematurely written off the black church as a meaningful social concern or political force. Yet, as the sociology of religion has demonstrated, it is difficult to meaningfully contemplate the progress of black identities in Britain without consideration of black spirituality. Both the black evangelical and Pentecostal traditions have shaped the interiority of the lives of the Caribbean of Caribbean diaspora subjects in both the Windrush and post Windrush eras. Arguably, in the 1970s, Margaret Thatcher had more interest and a better understanding of the politics of the Black Church compared to the Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies. Thatcher's lack of racial consciousness may have grated against the anti-racism of Black religion, but her neoliberal Protestant work ethic by stealth intoxicated quadrants of the black church, while at the same time, many on the left failed to move beyond a view of religion as an opiate. In summary then, Hall is the first and arguably the greatest African Caribbean scholar in post-war Britain. His place amongst the pantheon of black critical scholarship is undisputed. Yet, when positioned within the uncomfortable metrics of feminist theory in dialogue with Windrush diaspora culture, he is recast as a contested figure. But does the tension really matter? After all, the irony is that if you walk down the road today and ask any black Caribbean person who Stuart All is, I can almost guarantee that 99% could not tell you who he is or why he matters. Yet, most Caribbean people in Britain have benefited from the material consequences of his work on signifying practices and media representation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Beckford. I'm sure everybody was glued to that. And what I really liked about your presentation was the creativity that you added. So that politics and creative 
reminding us that, you know, our artistic expression, while it's entertaining, it can also be used to politicize, right? Politicize our issues. Um, what I'm going to do now um, before I get to the Q&A, um, we had some technical difficulty um, before, so I'm going to allow um, Professor Paulette Ramsey to do her excerpt from Letter Home. And I think it feeds very well into your presentation because it is through um, these types of memoirs and stories, journal writing, that allows us to even, again, politicize uh, Windrush. That is how I came to Windrush, um, through many of these poems, Linton Quigley Johnson, um, James Berry, Lucy poems telling, you know, through letter writing, telling us about the dear condition, um, that impact of, of racism. So I'm gonna ask um, Professor Ramsey to open her mic, please, and to take us to our virtual imagination, a creative virtual imagination of life or back in English time. Professor Ramsey. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I have to say that I'm very honored to have been allowed to read today. I'm reading from my novel, Letters Home, and my publisher, Hodder, in the UK, um, did a launch in Birmingham in October. They wanted to do that for Black History Month. The University of Birmingham was one of the places at which I read. So I'll read. I still remember the day my father said I had to leave Jamaica because he did not want me to breed up the place. If you stay here, you're just going to breed up the place, he said. I don't want you to have another child. He made all the plans without asking me anything. He was a big rice farmer, used 50 pounds to pay my fare to go to England on a ship. That was his idea of securing a better future for all of his children. My big sister Elsie and my big brothers Albert and Roy were already in England. I never knew what to expect in England. My father said we are British subjects so we can get British passport and the fare was not too, too expensive. He took me to Kingston on the milk truck with Mass Joe and put me on a ship called SS Irpinia in 1961, one year before Jamaica got independence. It was an Italian ship and was different from the ship my brother Albert came on. He came at the height of Windrush. Roy came on the SS Auriga and my sister came on that ship too. We came one by one. For the whole 21 days, I wondered what, when we would get across this big wide ocean to get where we were supposed to be going. When we finally got to Genoa, that was the first time I was realizing that we were not going straight to England on that ship. I never imagined such a hectic trip. Nobody explained anything to us at all. I did not hear if they said it. Imagine I went to Columbus home. What a voyage it was. It was like an I was just like an old time explorer. They hurried us off that ship and then we climbed onto another one. That ship took us to New Haven after another long journey. There was a lot of commotion in New Haven and without even a proper explanation of what was happening, they put us on a train that took us to Victoria Station. All this time, it was like I was just watching a movie with me as one of the actors, watching myself at the same time. It was like a game of getting on board, putting on the suitcase, stopping and taking off the suitcase again to go on another ship. From that time of hopscotching from ship to ship and ship to train, I started to suspect that life was not going to be easy in England. The journey alone was a big hassle and harassment. My brother Roy came to meet me at Victoria Station. I was so happy to see him. I hugged him. He took me to my sister Elsie's house. But I kept saying, it is better for me to go back home and look after my baby. My brother found a job for me and came and told me that I had to start the next day. He brought a new panty girdle which he said I must wear to keep my belly in. 
English women don't walk around with big belly, he said. That is why they look good. Put on the girdle and shape up yourself. You still have baby fat on your belly. I felt so ashamed to have my brother talk to me like that. I was really vexed with him. But I put it on to start the job the next morning. The girdle was so tight, I could hardly breathe. But when I looked in the mirror, it really made me look good. So I wear it. I tell you, woman would suffer for beauty. These days, I am too old for those things. I just want to be comfortable. Even though a lot of Windrush people and we who come after Windrush suffer so much in this place. A lot of us still made good, good life. We suffer, we work hard, but life smile on some of us. I will never forget the woman who took herself and went and joined London Metropolitan Police. She was the first black woman to do such a brave thing, and she was Jamaican. And I still remember when we saw her picture in the paper. I felt proud of her like she was my own sister. That woman was not easy because she was enrolled as a nurse too. She did a lot with her life when she came to England. England. Jamaica should be proud of her. Imagine. Little bit of Jamaica sent so many people to come and build up England, turn conductress and bus, nurse, cleaners. Sometimes I laugh and I say, look how black people come take over Mrs. Queen place. Imagine we have a young lady who is now in parliament. Well, she's not really young. Girl has Jamaican family. I tell you, never knew something like this would happen. We even have a fellow who is a bright, bright man over Birmingham University. I really remember his name now. Well, he used to be there, but I hear he has passed on now. Sometimes I just sit and laugh. Sometimes I say, we came and we suck bitter and sweet. In early 50s and 60s, black men didn't have anywhere to go for entertainment. So the first voice was a woman. This is a man now. They have to make their own because they couldn't go to the picture house, clubs, etc. So Saturday, you find a lot of black like myself dressing their three-piece suit and walk street until eventually they find a few pubs that would accept you. But the white man would move out or move to another room. As time progressed, things changed so much. They started to have music in pubs. At first, it was only piano. Then the blues beat. Some white woman loved it and could dance it. Those who couldn't quickly learned. That is when white get really worried about their woman. They were in danger of losing her as so many did. Black men start to marry white women. They use music as a trap to get them. No music never sweet white woman like the blues and then jazz and ska and rock steady later on. Music was a bait. Never had a white girlfriend. Sonia was my love. Sonia never stay. Girl in Jamaica was my better love. Sonia left. Sonia and Teddy boys beat me. Why? England did stay a bad mash up, bum out after the war. We work hard in England, we coal, we suffer. White people hate us, treat us like dirt. Teddy boys hate us. I hate them. Say no more West Indian in the place. Nig nags. Sure. People poor. Look hungry. I keep wondering why my father sent me to this dark place to starve and die. Die alone. Burn. Nobody cares. Someday I'll go where Jesus lives. Somebody tell me our Nancy story now. Jack Mandora, me not choose none. My mother tell me our Nancy story all the time. Moonshine, darling. Hold me tight, tight, me biddy. We come, we work, we build. We build this place. I suffer in this place. And I was here in 1958. But I wasn't in Notting Hill, or I would join the riot, help mash up the place. 
Teddy boys caused big riot in Notting Hill. And then they came to Birmingham and beat black man. I want to go home. But my mother and father died long, long ago. I want to see Jamaica before I die. I want them to take my body to Jamaica and bury me beside my mother. But who will do it? Don't know where anybody is. Roy. Roy will come one day. Roy will come again. My brother Roy. Someday I go where Jesus live. I will fly away. Someday I see my mama and my papa. I go home. I go home. I don't want to see Sonia. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Professor Ramsey. I love that um, captivating story. I'm sure everyone here was captivated. It speaks so much to the diaspora and the way you know the character while writing in this foreign land, that Englishness that Stuart Hall talks about, at the same time, that Caribbeanness. So we hear it through the proverbs, the different um, expressions that's used um, throughout the the story. And again, as I mentioned earlier, it is through these creative pieces that we're able to retain and maintain, um, preserve the memories of Windrush because that letter writing is very significant. It wasn't only telling us about the Windrush, but it was also connecting. He was connecting back home because it was letting us, right, uh, well, those who stayed behind get a sense of what was happening and also you know, that idea of cultural retention. So much thanks. Um, I might even have a question for you, um, Major <laughs> Prof. Ramsey. So please stick around because I'm, this panel is very rich. As you can see, everybody, most people here have offered some form of creativity in the way they've expressed um, Windrush. We have a filmmaker, um, we have an, um, Robert um, Beckford, um, also the artist, Dr. Johnson, and we have you know, the writer here. I don't, I'm still trying to figure out my creativity, but nonetheless, I enjoy it. <laughs> I enjoy it. So I'm going to um, go to the question and answer. Um, before I do that, I want to just quickly acknowledge, it's very important I acknowledge um, Susan Leiberg, who has joined us. Um, Sue, Sue, Sue Leiberg, she is the National Windrush Museum Director, and she's also one of the organizers for the Windrush uh, 75 um, next month, um, June the 22nd to the 24th in Birmingham. So thanks for joining us and welcome um, Sue. So I'm going to I'm find out right now if there are any questions. I'm going to check my phone. I'm with, or working from my phone here. I can't see the chat box. If you could put, um, hey Dan, if you could please put any questions in the, in the chat box for me to, yes. I see Dr. Goss has a question. Go ahead, Dr. Goss. Yes, um, thank you so very much, um, Prof. Uh, Robert, for a, a very inspiring um, presentation and thought-provoking. And I think you're correct on that point about spirituality um, and, and its underestimation. But I, I, I just want to go back to this issue of positioning and impact. Um, that comparison between James Cone and at Hall, um, in a sense, could be considered a little bit, a little bit unfair to some extent. Um, I'm, I'm sure that um, Cone grew up in, seg in a segregated community, and in that kind of context, the church is the backbone of one's life in those communities. And so, uh, that comparison, therefore, if we contrast Hall, who grew up in middle class uptown Jamaica to, to a great extent, parents not necessarily. Um, really just in that sense. The grandmother in Old Harbor, I think, but Old Harbor was religious and based on what I remember from the, the biography that um, only when he went to his grandmother's house, he heard a nice pulsating, you know, um, black music, but he didn't really grow up in a, that kind of consciousness or context in comparison with Paul. So just how would you respond to that kind of criticism that you, you, you're not called you're not a little bit hard. <laughs> you're going to bury him to, to James Cohn. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a, a really good question. Uh, two things come to mind in terms of responding. Um, and it's really around the choice of ideology to work with, Cohn choosing black power and Hall appropriating ideas from uh, neo-Marxist thought within Europe. And it's because 
in the discussion with Cohn, and also he mentions this within his own autobiography, there was a point in, in his academic career where he had a choice which tools to use. So yes, there was the consciousness of the church behind it, but he chose black power because it felt it would give him the tools to do a kind of racial critique that wasn't just for the empowerment of, of whites, but fundamentally to engage with proletarian, working class, working poor, black people through the church network and, and beyond the church network. So for me, you're right, their backgrounds aren't necessarily the same, although you know they experience some of the same socio-political forces, colonization, uh, the emancipation movement, but then they're also, uh, at a point in the 1960s, exposed to radical ideas. And I'm just saying that, you know, the choice that Cohn makes, makes him not only uh, deconstruct or bust the myths about blackness, but also challenge the myth about the place of the black uh, intellectual and their positioning. Um, and obviously it's a contrast to produce a critique and to open up questions like this about the role of the intellectual and how whether or not our positionality in many respects reinforces negative myths and ideas within black communities and therefore impacts and limits our, the reception of our ideas. Thanks. Thank you, um, um, Dr. Beckford. Um, I just want to follow up on that uh, question as well. Um, you mentioned in terms of communist party and also black power, but weren't there also persons who were part of the black power movement? They had some form of communist ideals. Like I'm thinking of Kwesi Linton Johnson, who was a leftist and he was also very black power. So I would, I wanted to know how that would fit into the, the response you just said to um, Dr. Goss, because there were a lot of, uh, quite a few number of um, activists who were black power and they were also embracing communism. Yeah, yeah, completely. And I think you've hit a really good point there in that if you look at the uh, Race Today magazine that was formed by Adakis Howe and also Linton Kwesi Johnson, they were part of the left, but the black power activism actually brought them much closer to black communities and a form of organic intellectualism where they were really synthesizing and engaging with the ideas and trying to articulate practices for the struggle. Uh, so I think that gave them a certain edge and um, domestication uh, compared to Hall in many respects, although neither Darkest Howe or Linton Crazy Johnson were, you know, working their way through the university system. But you're quite right, there was that combination. But the black power um, uh, principles, uh, especially in terms of um, self-help, um, um, self-determination, organizing, disorganized, um, disenfranchised black communities, that, that, that takes you in a very different direction than new lift, left discourse around the role of culture and semiotic thought and the, you know, um, um, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, some of the other theoretical ideas that didn't necessarily resonate with where everyday ordinary black folk were coming from. And I think the, the black power dimensions moved those activists in a very different direction. A, a similar contrast could be made between Hall and Bernie Grant, the political activist who became part of the Labour Party. And again, the ideologies they appropriated led them in very different directions, had, had a massive impact on the British Labour Party. In many respects, Hall's ideas became more dominant um, ironically, than, than those of Bernie Grant. But again, Grant's grasp of black radicalism, black power, led him to engage in a more uh, community-based organic intellectualism than the kind of intellectual tradition that Hall embodies. And, and what I'm trying to say here, I mean, it's very provocative to ask these questions because it, those of us in the academy think that we're doing work on behalf of our communities and often we're not, we're just reinforcing myths about our position uh, because our work isn't necessarily aimed at engaging with those communities. Even if our work is non-scholarly activity, so to speak, it's practical work, often it still misses the mark. And, and therefore, you know, um, it, it, we need to reassess uh, the value of this work and who it's being done for and who our audiences are. And, and therefore, consequently, how revolutionary it really is. Thank you. Um... Dr. Rob um, Beckford. Um, looking, okay, I have another question to throw at you. Um, and it's very similar. I, I know also to, because I see this in other diaspora spaces, like say maybe Toronto, um, where 
the church is very important, very seminal. But at the same token, from some from your perspective, you know, given that you do black theology, some of the churches that are very, you know, seminal because they, you know, they're a haven for immigration, um, et cetera. I, I know um Dr. Goss did a, a presentation yesterday and he spoke about that, you know, they did they were there for food bank, et cetera. But also um from your perspective as a black liberation theologist, um, some of these churches were not they were they were Christians first or Pentecostal first rather than say engaging in black activities like they were not a part of the black power movement at all um, and they were not really listening to the Kitchener or a part of yeah. the black activities that would have solidified our presence or assertion they were really about religion. So as a black theologist, what, how would you position that again, like speaking to, you know, Paul's work? Sure, sure. Look, I'd, I'd say two things that are really significant. Firstly, I think you have to have a more nuanced reading of the establishment of African Caribbean churches in Britain. And why I say it needs to be more nuanced is because their creation emerges at the same time that black radicals are beginning to organize black communities for self-defense, because they recognize that life in Britain is going to be incredibly hostile. So if you look at 1958, 1959, there are riots that take place because there's a tragic murder of a black man, Kelso Cochrane, in 59 in England. Black churches about that time begin to start to organize because they're conscious of what's happening. So I would argue that in its uh, uh, original state, the black church is part of a move of black nationalism. How are we going to save these people? We've got to organize. We're going to do it through religion as well. Let's use religion as a tool. However, this is the second point. What limits them is their ideology, their theology. Their theology is colonial. It's colonial theology from the Caribbean, from the European waves of colonial Christianity, but it's also a neo-colonialism that impacts them in terms of the Euro-American forms of Pentecostalism, evangelical church tradition. And I argue as well, their hymnody you know, which comes out of these traditions also reinforces these ideas of faith being personal and private rather than being social and, and political. So it's rather more complex on one level. They represent the only black nationally organized group across the UK. That and the old South system network, old South system network's gone, but the black churches remain. So we need to appraise them as, a, as Roswood Gerloff does, as a form of black power. You know, in her book, um, uh, uh, A Plea for Black British Theology, she makes that claim. She goes, well, who else has organized black people in this way in Britain? You know, so that's the first thing. But uh, I guess, consequently, because of the reach of the church into popular culture, into music, into the arts, into politics, the neglect by the Centre for Contemporary Cultural Studies, how it's written off, um, even the work of the genius that is Paul Gilroy, a small acts as one line that just writes off black religion completely. Well, I think that, that, that's, that neglect reinforces the view within black communities that some of the deep existential questions that we have about life and how we struggled are irrelevant to these folk. And therefore they reinforce certain myths that are problematic alongside the myths that they, they do deconstruct. And I'm just saying, I think that, that, that raises questions about the trajectory and impact and reception, reception of the work. Can and here, hey, oh. hold on. If we're thinking about decolonizing ways of knowing, then you know we've got to place uh, our, our critical ideas alongside the ways of knowing and the concerns of everyday ordinary black folk, because these are these are ways of knowing that come from the underside, you know, myth making in black communities is a form of, uh, you know, critical evaluation. It's a form of knowledge production. So, you know, it's a way of decolonizing um, these critical actors. Much thanks, um, Dr. Beckford. It, it seems as though we have a model already of the African American. Um, they have been using their church in the very similar way that you talked about that black power and they've used it um, during the civil rights movement. They've never really separated the two as the way the Caribbean diaspora has done so. So there's that model and you're correct. That is the way we need to start looking at it because of how the churches have mobilized um, black people within those contexts. 
Um, I have a question here. I'm going to go to the uh, audience, the virtual audience. We don't want to exclude our virtual audience, and then I'll come back if there are any other questions. And also, please um, feel free to ask um, Paulette um, Ramsey if there are any questions, because I, her story really connects um, nicely, very, the, the tropes really connect nicely with what we're discussing, because I have a question for her later. All right, so um, Yu Dells, who's also um, in the ICS, um, he's asking, first he said, thank you for your lecture. It is true that Hall is not autobiographical in his work until his later years. By then, he connects much of his life and work to his theory expressed in Familiar state Stranger. Um, he's asking, how, could, how would you comment on that personal as political as carried in his own narrative of his trauma? Yeah, I think I think that's completely right in terms of it's only later there's the kind of reflection and to a degree a certain regret in, in the kind of life that he's lived and longing for the life that he could have lived back home in, in Jamaica. I, I think, look, I think it's, it's, it's consistent with his ideas about identity, about the fissures, about the hybridity, about the sense of alienation. And, and that makes that makes sense to me that that's all there. However, it's fair to say not all black people in Britain had those anxieties, you know, and that those anxieties over identity and the tension, uh, you know, come out of a particular social location. You know, there were other forms of black identities being constructed during the time of the Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies. You know, there's a, a black religious identity that forged blackness with spirituality. Rastafari movement, the black nationalist groups, um, as well as people who were living these hybridized kind of um, identities that hold goes on to uh, develop as new ethnicities. So I'm, I'm just saying it's much more complex picture that's taking place. And we see this when we place Hall alongside what was happening in working class, working poor, uh, uh, black diaspora communities. So that's what I'm trying to do is say that, you know, we have the work of the theorist. And then we have what's really happening on the ground. What, why does this matter? Because there is a tendency in our history to look at what the great and good are doing and neglect what's happening on the ground. You know, think, think of the turn of the century, uh, not this century, the last century, Marcus Garvey and Du Bois are going at it regarding similar questions. What's the place of black people in the diaspora and what's happening on the ground? Women's groups, churches, civic societies, moving a million African-Americans from the Jim Crow South into the industrialized North. Uh, that, that's the biggest change that's taken. They miss uh, the, the, this revolutionary moment. Uh, none of them really comment on it. And I'm suggesting that uh, there may be something worth researching in Hall's canon when we place it in context to what's happening in diaspora communities in those, in, in those key historic moments. Not everybody's wrestling with those questions. Not everybody's interested in the politics of representation. Instead, they're creating imagery and artifacts and, um, um, and, um, um, and um, ideas about what it means to be black outside of mainstream media. Thanks so much, um, Dr. Beckford, again, for that response. You're really throwing out a lot of um, food to eat because um, just even in the Americas uh, where you saw uh, Anglo-Caribbean people, particularly groups who were practicing non-traditional Christian religion like Santa Maria and Condomble, and this was in like say in New York. Um, so I, I clearly see where you're going with that. And also even the way you talk about the theory and the everyday, um, where you speak to Vivi Clarks, she has a term where she used diaspora literacy. And that's where she encourages to use like where the everyday, the concrete, what yeah. you do, how that becomes embodied within a theory, a theoretical frame. So mm -hmm. we're really, as Afro or diaspora people, we're really living theory that's being packages, packaged in the academy as theory, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. I, I see Dr. J um, Johnson has his hand up. Go ahead, Dr. Johnson. Yeah, so my question really relates to um, cultural studies. Um, Stuart Hall has a significant impact, um, obviously, on our understanding of cultural studies, um, particularly post-war, uh, post-Second World War Britain, and that interacted um, with um, uh, the arrival of Empire Windrush and a number of other ships, as you know. 
Um, in his work with Raymond Williams at the Birmingham School, Stuart started to look at Hell's Angels. He started to look at jazz and all of this stuff. Um, as you say, Robert was really moving theory into practice and, you know, starting to grapple with the underside of culture, so to speak. Now, my question is this. Um, what are your thoughts about the emergence of a, a new cultural studies, and particularly um, in relation to issues of um, new identity formations, um, cultural hybridities, um, a lot of the work that you're now doing, looking at music and unwrapping that and reforming that and remixing that, rewinding that, how, how is that kind of developing uh, particularly with the the new generations of Windrush comments, please. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a, that's a really, really good question. I mean, there there are some questions raised about how many black cultures feature in Hall's work. You know, you mentioned some of the uh, you know you know rituals of resistance. There aren't too many black cultural groups that that you know make it into that text. So again, you know, it, it, the work is brilliant, but it's not necessarily. Um, engaged fully with what's happening on the ground in terms of black communities in, in that period. In terms of the new cultural studies, I think that, again, what I'm suggesting, you know, in terms of this paper is we look at the cultural movements in which we're attempting to form our ideas. So while on the one hand, there is an attempt to think about super diversity, um, you know, new hybrid identities, Af West African communities and, and the kind of uh, um, new formations that emerge from West African communities merging with Caribbean communities, the, the rise of mixed heritage as the dominant uh, new ethnicity, all of those things are really quite important, but I'm interested in how they get played out alongside new forms of pessimism in black and brown communities, the emergence of a black British Afro pessimism, a sense that 75 years after Windrush, we, we, you know, we really can't destroy or radically alter white supremacy in Britain. Therefore, we've got to find other ways in which we exist and re-exist in light of this. So I'm interested in the theory, but I'm not sure whether or not it ultimately connects with what are some of the powerful movements, Black Lives Matter. Not too many people talking about uh, hybrid identities there talking in much more structural terms about black subordination. You know, um, you know, if we're looking at the Windrush scandal. Yeah, you know, not, not many people talking about mixity there. It's much more about long-standing traditions of disrespect. So it's how they're played out in dialogue with that, that, that interests me, because that's the way in which I try to do my own work. Yeah, you know, uh, whether it's film, whether it's music production or, or drama or, uh, or other forms of artistic practice. I'm interested in making connections with these broad social movements, engaging with the struggle and providing resources primarily uh, for people to work within uh, those struggles more successfully. So I think it's about the broader context as well. Well, does it need to be one or the other? Uh, no, it should be both and. You know, if we want to be uh, a diunital about this, then yeah, it can be both and. It doesn't have to be either or. But I'm just suggesting here that if we place Hall within the everyday, it kind of raises um, some other questions about, you know, whether we, uh, it really touches the existential bone and, and the high point, uh, you know, the, the spot of what's really happening on the ground, especially in terms of black church life, then no. And black religious life, then no. And how do you see the, um, um, sorry, Dr. Sorry, Lee, my the, the, the Caribbean um, popular culture, um, Kingston popular culture, Jamaica popular culture feeding into um, those narratives? Oh, sorry, I didn't catch the first part. The, 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 um, uh, it was a bit blurry. Could you repeat it, please? Now, I was saying that how do you see the Caribbean popular culture, um, particularly Jamaican popular culture, and what's coming out of Kingston? feeding into those new narrative formations? Well, I think it's the evidence is that it's much more complex now. There is, uh, if we're talking about 40 years ago, Caribbean culture was a dominant cultural resource across all youth cultures within Britain. Now there's more to play with. There's West African, there's East African, Central African, there's new forms of Latin American diasporic traditions and musics within Britain. Britain uh, British urban music culture is incredibly diverse, incredibly hybrid. 
Um, the problem is, though, it's still structured to maintain a particular kind of economic product, which means that even with all that creativity, the music can still sound uh, relatively similar and unchanged because there is there's a market and there's marketing and it has to reproduce particular forms of black artistic practice to to sell you know so so even though there's this creativity it doesn't necessarily make the chart but also we've got to acknowledge that the new radical forms of technology are going to completely change the way in which we produce and consume music a te technology meaning that we you can re reproduce drake a uh, Drake type beat and sound and even voice in, in a matter of minutes. You know, I mean, it's going to revolutionize how we uh, market music and how we understand what music production is. So I think all of these things are making it much more complex to hear uh, the Jamaican voice, so to speak, as the, the dominant voice in, in black music culture in Britain in particular. Plus also, look, I would argue uh, the Jamaican uh, music industry hasn't been that diasporic in the last 20 plus years as it was in the 1970s, 1980s, where just in terms of lyrical content, there was greater reference to other parts of the world, greater reference to the African continent. We've now become much more local in in black music the you know representing what's happening around the corner rather than what's happening on the other side of the world and as a consequence of that the music therefore again in just in terms of lyrical content doesn't make those kind of connections that inspire young people uh, older people in other parts of uh, the caribbean diaspora so there's a marketing job to do to make the music sell but maybe you know you know i could be missing the mark there maybe it doesn't need to do that it's just about the aesthetic instead Thanks, um, Dr. Beckford. Um, I think it's more about the aesthetics <laughs> because I, I think the local has been contextualized within the local. When we look yeah. at um, Jamaican music and the way they're singing about the themes have been localized in places like Mexico, Fiji Island, so places that we don't mm -hmm. expect it to be. So I'm, I'm just being a, a troublemaker. <laughs> no, 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 it's a good point, it's a good point. Yeah. So um, very, I'm going to go back to our virtual audience so we can grab back our virtual audience here. Um, Susan Fredericks has a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much, all. Um, Nadine Hall says, fantastic lecture, fantastic discussion, and a fantastic excerpt by Dr. Ramsey. And um, Yu Dell has a comment where he says, also, like Dr. Goss, I am curious that you see Black Power as a more legitimate house of resistance. He does write on Rastafari as a black spiritual space fun fact he says he was a preacher as a youth and he also mentions the um one of the rebellion uh church rebellions enslaved um, rebellion in jamaica that is um, the baptist war that has again in um, slavery and he, he mentioned it as a, a space of resistance so again feeding into what you said earlier um right and I wanted to know if there's any other questions. Um, we're pressing for time. Well, we have enough, we're kind of wrapping up shortly, but I know there may be other questions that are coming in. I see, uh, I just have to uh, go down further. Oh. A very interesting lecture coming from um, Gail Reed. And I'm just wondering if there are any other questions, Dr. Goss, um, Dr. Johnson, I'm not seeing any coming from the audience, any further ones um, before we wrap up. Any other questions? No? Okay. I just had a quick question for um, Dr. Ramsey or um, Professor Ramsey, if you want to just jump in, Professor Ramsey. Um, your poem or your, your book, uh, I found it was very, as I kept mentioning, how it's a very creative and also very political. Uh, when you wrote these letters, did you have that political in mind or were you just writing it from a creative position? Because it speaks so vividly to Windrush in the discussion. It could have easily been the lecture. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very interesting question. Remember that my research is in the area of diasporic studies and migration studies. So every time I write, whether it's prose or poetry, I'm always finding ways of sort of feeding the way I think politically into my writing. So that, that's one perspective. 
the other aspect, the other perspective that feeds into this work is my background as the child of Windrush people. Um, all my uncles, my own mother, my siblings, all my siblings have grown up in the UK. And I, I wanted to get into the conversation because I, I think one of the things I would say is that perhaps we need to guard a little against being too monolithic, right? When we talk about um, the, the diaspora community in the UK, because I have my siblings, I have my nieces and nephews. I have a nephew who is a DJ playing only Jamaican, hard Jamaican dance hall reggae music speaks with with uh an almost um sometimes i can't understand his british accent but also very fluent in creole so there, there's and my siblings are anglican none of my siblings goes to a pentecostal or church of god church so, so there's there's so many layers to the discussion but what the starting point for me is always writing from the position, my position as somebody who does a lot of work on diaspora studies, migration studies, not just in the Caribbean, but in across Latin America, as you know. And the novel has come out of a lot of fieldwork, a lot of conversations with my mother, my uncles, their friends, a whole lot of people um, whose voices are in this, this work. Much thanks, uh, Professor Ramsey, for that. And that's a good way to end because as academics, oftentimes we're seen as just sitting up in the ivy tower writing. And what this panel just did, it showed us that as academics, um, Professor Ramsey made it clear that her work, right, her experience, her life, her impact that she's, you know, the impact of Windrush comes out within her stories. And likewise, um, Dr. Beckford, again, I see your work is coming out through your film. Likewise, um, Dr. Johnson, his work is he's an artist. Again, we engage, we're constantly engaging in, in this work, this, web, um, this um, diasporic literacy. And I, I'm, I'm really excited about it. That's why I keep, you know, blabbing, blabbing on about this um, creativity. So I'm going to end it here and thank all of the, the panelists. And as we come to the con a conclusion, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Candia Mitchell Hall, who's a lecturer at the Institute of Caribbean Studies, and her specialization is African diaspora heritage and memory. With right here at the Institute of Caribbean Studies, we couldn't have made a, con a, a, a proper connection, could we? We're always with diaspora. <laughs> Go ahead, um, Dr. Hall. Yes, thank you, Dr. Tomlinson, for your introduction. And um, to the viewers, thanks for being here with us. So we've come to the end of such an inspiring and um, very thought-provoking lecture. And I think I can safely conclude that uh, the aim of the lecture has been fully accomplished. Um, the annual Stuart Hall lecture was imagined to commemorate the memory, the work, and the life of the intellectual giant cultural theorist Stuart Hall and to reach out to the wider community to recall and to remember and to think through Stuart Hall's intellectual investment and theoretical interventions in the region struggles um, and especially that aspect treating with black cultural diasporas his own experiences in Britain and and certainly part of the the, the lecture's mandate is to help us understand how Stuart Hall's crossing into Britain would contribute to the making of the diasporic ethos Stuart Hall would internalize and, and think through and, and one in which we could engage the mapping of his intellectual responses to his own lived experiences in the diaspora. So, so this lecture has certainly enlarged our understanding of how diasporans become continuously and how they overcome that sense of out of jointness, out of placeness, outside of the Caribbean, you know, and, and we could also imagine the kind of hope of belonging, indifference and otherness. We heard some of that coming out um, from all of the talks here, this kind of otherness in the diaspora and, and, and operating indifference. So, 
So I think if Stuart Hall was here, he would permit me to share my appreciation to those who made this event a memorable one. Um, Dr. Tomlinson, Dr. Lisa Tomlinson, you're, you did such an excellent job at, at, at hosting this event and, and setting the tone and the right pace. Um, fabulous job, and I want to thank you for that. I commend Dr. Dave Goss, the director of the Institute of Caribbean Studies for continuing the tradition of critically engaging Stuart Hall and allowing for the critical engagement of Stuart Hall's ethos and, and also for bringing warm greetings on behalf of the department. Um, Dr. Les Brown, the founder and chair of the National Windrush Museum, thank you for marking this annual lecture with us and for your wider work on diasporan museums and diasporan studies. Um, and of course, the Professor Paulette Ramsey here with us at the UWI. Thanks for sharing excerpts from your classic treasure. We are all acquainted with it. Um, and, and some of us should be more acquainted with it. Let us home. Um, you would refresh us, uh, you know, on the experiences of Caribbean migrants in, in, in Britain through the first person narrative and this kind of discovery and rediscovery of diaspora again and again. It really did hit a nerve. I want to Thank you for pointing out some of the social values in diaspora that they found in Britain, finding self um, and, and trying to locate self in the diaspora. To Dr. Deborah Hickling Gordon, thanks for introducing us to the guest speaker and for doing the research on him. We heard it coming out. And uh, of course, uh, Professor Robert Beckford, thank you so much for your thought provoking provocations, the ambivalence of diaspora. Call was not immune from, from, from the diaspora and ethos, feelings of dislodging and dismantling. He also made myths while he broke myths. And, and, and it is quite clear that that is how diaspora operates in two-ness, in the dialectic. I thank you so much for placing Hall within this broader diaspora and context, um, for, for bringing out, you know, and underscoring his social, the social value of his work, his attempts to resist the politics of diaspora, um, and, 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 and certainly for positioning Hall's conversation in, in, in concert with, with other thinkers and, 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 and for pulling out the praxis of diaspora and his diasporic intervention, how he made person, person making, I heard a lot of that coming out, his personhood, the problems of diaspora, and of course, Hall's intricate um, ethics of care, his, his, his concern, his care, and his organic intellectualism, his counter-hegemonic work. I, I want to thank you for provoking us to the very end, um, for asking, and, and this, 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 thought for provoking question, the impact of Paul's memory, I wrote it down, in the Caribbean versus his memory in Britain. Give us a lot of, of, of food for thought there. I want to thank you greatly um, for that and for certainly pointing out um, and, and for perhaps um, implicitly, perhaps explicitly too, um, making the point that there is a need to keep the memory and work of Paul alive. In the, in the Caribbean. Um, to our hardworking admin staff, uh, you work behind the scenes um, through every technical glitch and uh, you make these events seamless. We appreciate you so much. And to you, our viewers uh, or audience, thanks for listening. Thanks for participating. We hope to see you next year for another annual distinguished lecture. Perhaps Hall would say there is solace in closure. And so as we close, I bid you peace and blessings. Take care. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Mitchell Hall. Just one last announcement, a very quick announcement um, for those of you in the Birmingham area, June 23rd to 24th, you can get your tickets for the conference, Windrush 75 on Eventbrite. So go to Eventbrite, get your ticket. And also for a copy of Professor Ramsey's book, it's available on Amazon. So yes, I'll be getting my <laughs> copy. So I hope you're there for, you're gonna be available for my autograph. <laughs> for your autograph, right? Yes, I need to come um, get yeah. your autograph. So um, yes, and we are out. <laughs>